Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Todd Rosenbluth from CFRA Research, and thanks for joining us for key ETF themes to the new normal economy. We'll move to the next slide here, and so you'll get a sense of not only uh, what I look like. Uh, actually, here's our disclaimer. We'll move to the next slide. Uh, to I'm joined by Jay Jacobs, uh, who's the head of research and strategy of Global X, and we're going to talk about thematic investing and the reopening economy. We'll move to the next slide here to just give you a sense of the overall agenda. Uh, a reminder of who we are at CFRA. Uh, we'll talk about the global ETF demand and specifically thematic ETFs. Then Jay's going to join to talk about the pandemic uh, and, and the accelerated themes that happened as a result of the pandemic. And then what themes are well positioned for the new normal. And of course, there'll be disclosures at the back. We'll move to the next slide here. Uh, and another one to just to remind you about who CFRA is and how our ETF research that we're going to be talking about during the presentation fits in with our overall company research. So we cover individual stocks from evaluation and risk perspective, from fundamental and forensic perspectives, and that rolls into our ETF research. And above that is a sector and industry calls on individual uh, sectors and then a top-down view. So you can see we're covering the gamut with fundamental and forensic research. On the next slide here, we'll just talk more about our overall ETF research. Our goal is to be forward-looking. We look inside the portfolio. You'll get a sense of that when we talk about some of the specific ETFs. Performance is part of the process that we have, but we're leveraging our team of equity and accounting analysts to assess the future prospects. And specifically with thematic investing, the prospects are really important. So it's important that you understand that there's a, the foundation behind what goes behind our ETF research. We'll move to the next slide and one quick one that just is a reminder that we don't manage money. We don't have an asset management arm. We are independent from not only Global X uh, that we showed earlier, whose ETFs we have a rating on, but all asset managers that we are covering from an ETF and a mutual fund perspective, uh, nothing that's gonna cloud our judgment to provide the ratings. On the next slide here, we're gonna show you just uh, where we are in the ETF marketplace. And I'm focusing specifically on the global equity side of the market. Uh, we've seen strong demand, a recovery for global equity ETFs uh, in, in not only the past year, but specifically since the start of the year, you can see what we refer to as global broad or regional uh, securities or ETFs have been very popular, but so have thematic ETFs. And, and we're gonna cover some of those today, but thematic ETF investing has skyrocketed. Uh, we've seen over a fourfold increase in just the past year and not in the overall assets and new products are coming out, which is a good reminder that you need to dig into the underlying portfolios. And I've got one last slide here to show you uh, on the next slide here that is going to talk about, we're going to talk about infrastructure ETFs. Jay's going to spend a good amount of time talking about why infrastructure makes sense, talk about the infrastructure bill. I want to just highlight uh, two of the larger infrastructure named ETF, IGF, uh, which is an iShares product, and PAVE, which is a global X ETF. And we're showing those in relation to a global industrials sector ETF, uh, EXI. And you can see a widespread of performance, not only between those two infrastructure ETFs, but whether infrastructure ETFs like PAVE were a good investment in the past year. Again, past performance, not indicative of future results. On the next slide here, we're gonna just bring up a poll question. We just wanna have a better understanding of how you're using ETFs within your practice. Is this more than 50%? Is this uh, between 25 and 50%? Or is ETF something that you're still getting your arms around and deciding how it fits into your clients uh, or your own portfolios? So if you haven't voted, please do so. And in that, I'm going to uh, move us to the next slide, if we can, and welcome uh, Jay Jacobs uh, again from Global X. Jay, thanks for joining me. Uh, kick us off. Todd, thanks for having me, and thanks uh, to everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, really briefly about Global X, uh, we are an ETF issuer based out of Manhattan uh, with over 80 ETFs and 28 billion in assets under management. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we can just show the breakdown. Uh, over half of our assets come from our thematic growth suite, which has uh, 26 uh, ETFs currently. So we really uh, have developed an expertise in thematic investing uh, over the last 10 years since the launch of our first product in the space, 
which is our lithium and battery technology ETF. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we're going to be talking about you know the new normal economy and which themes really are standing to benefit from this uh, new stage of the pandemic, perhaps the you know the last stage of the pandemic. Um, and we're going to be looking at it from this thematic lens. So first and foremost, we just kind of want to get on the same page with what is thematic investing. Uh, we define it as a forward-looking investment approach uh, that's really looking at these powerful macro-level trends and the companies that stand to benefit from the materialization of those trends. So it's long-term growth-focused strategies. They're not constrained by geographic or sector definitions. They're these more concentrated portfolios that tend to have low correlations to other parts of your portfolio. And often they're relatable concepts. They're things that we're reading about that we're seeing in our everyday lives and can experience in person. Uh, this all stands in contrast to other forms of investing, uh, you know, smart beta factor investing, which tends to be more backward looking and really kind of based in data and trying to make observations that we think are going to carry forward. So thematic investing is really its own in, uh, investment approach. Uh, we've seen rapid growth of thematic investing over just the last year. Uh, in the ETF world, it's grown from about 25 billion to over 133 billion in assets uh, since Q1 of, tw of 2020. So this is a, a, a fast growing investment approach as people think about you know, how to position their portfolios for a very different world that we're entering into. Next. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 26 themes. Uh, we're gonna highlight two of them today, um, but we follow a very rigid process for how we choose which themes to launch, uh, which is largely focused on conviction. Do we believe that this theme is going to play the way we expect it to? Is it investable? Can we get good exposure to that theme through publicly traded equities? And the time frame is this something that's going to play out over more than a decade uh, or be potentially evergreen in nature? Um, the last part here, the time frame, is actually what's kind of most relevant to this uh, to, uh, to this presentation today. The pandemic was you know, a once in a generation or, or you know, maybe once in a century event um, that had a profound impact on our lives, on our economy, and of course, on many of the themes that, uh, that we'll be touching on today. But obviously the pandemic in the grand scheme of things was a fairly short period of time. Uh, if we enter the new normal in the next couple of quarters, you know, we might look back and say this pandemic was a year, a year and a half, maybe two years maximum. In the grand scheme of things of long-term investing, that can be a flash in the pan. So the themes that we're gonna talk about today were not created because of the pandemic. They were not created for the pandemic. They were themes that we've already identified that we believed were going to grow regardless. You know, Many of these products launched before uh, that we ever knew about COVID-19, but the influence of the pandemic has accelerated many of these themes in ways that would not have happened organically. So we'll touch on that as well. Next. All right, so uh, first I wanna kind of recap um, what has happened over the last year, uh, which is namely the pandemic accelerating several themes. Um, and uh, we're really looking at kind of four distinct timeframes for the pandemic uh, when we talk about accelerating themes. If you go to the next slide, uh, we can show those four phases. Um, the first phase was the pre-COVID economy. Uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning of 2020, uh, COVID was emerging in, in China at the time, in Wuhan. People didn't really know what to make of it, didn't know if it would spread across the globe. In the United States, people were still very much just focused on the U.S.-China trade deal more than, you know, what might be a global pandemic. That, of course, all changed by March. We're all very familiar with the stay-at-home economy. When the economy was shut down, everyone was locked inside virtually, uh, and things came to a dramatic halt. Then, since then, uh, basically in, in around July of last year, we started entering the reopening economy where our doors could maybe open halfway. We could start thinking about sending our kids back to school. You could go into stores if it was one or two people and you're wearing a mask. Maybe people are going into the office every now and again. But it was really this tenuous environment where we're trying to get away from that stay-at-home economy. It's trying to get more uh, in-person economic activity going on while also protecting people and staying safe as the pandemic continued to rage. So the final stage of all of this will be that new normal economy that I've alluded to. It's when reopening is finally complete, uh, that the pandemic is largely under control, uh, and that um, we can resume some sort of normalcy uh, in society and, and in the broader economy. But what I would also highlight with these four phases is that the new normal economy is not a return to the pre-COVID economy. We're not going to just zoom backwards two years and pick up where we left off. 
there are lasting implications of COVID-19 uh, that are going to have uh, implications on the economy and on us as consumers and workers and, and everything we do uh, for decades to come. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll touch on kind of what happened in that stay-at-home economy very briefly. The main takeaway from the stay-at-home economy was that many themes, from a thematic perspective, the main takeaway was that many themes were accelerated and expanded during that time frame. While we couldn't shop outside, uh, we suddenly had to quickly transition a lot of our shopping habits to e-commerce. While we couldn't go to sporting events or go to concerts or live activities, we transferred a lot of that uh, leisure and entertainment to streaming, which we could do comfortably from our homes, uh, working rather than going into the office, moving a lot of those applications and data to something that was accessible via the cloud at home. A lot of these technologies, again, already in existence, uh, but we saw the acceleration of the adoption of those technologies as we really didn't have any choice. Um, maybe we were going to do more e-commerce in the next few years, but we saw that huge acceleration because we were forced to. And many of these technologies reached a new market than ever anticipated. Uh, think of the senior generation using e-commerce for the first time because they didn't, yeah, because they really didn't have any other choices. Or emerging markets adopting these technologies as they needed to use the latest technology to be able to function during the stay-at-home economy. But this uh, acceleration and expansion of many themes led to very high growth rates uh, for uh, for several themes um, during that stay-at-home economy phase. You go to the next slide. Uh, two of the themes that really stand out, um, e-commerce, as I mentioned, in Q2 of 2020, really the, the, the thick of, uh, of, um, of the stay-at-home economy, growing 45% uh, over the same quarter a year prior, e-commerce penetration jumping from about 11.5% of total U.S. retail sales to over 15%. Similarly, massive acceleration on the video game side. As I mentioned, the, the move from live entertainment to digital entertainment, uh, video games are really squarely in that, in that space, uh, allowing people to play games at home, to play games with friends over the internet. And we saw an acceleration of revenues as well in Q2 of 2020, rising 25% in that quarter versus many quarters of single digit growth. Jay, I want to leave us here for a second, uh, if I can. Just to highlight, um, eBiz would be the digital, the e-commerce side. That's the global X product that's tied to it. And Hero is the video gaming related product. But I want to, if you can, just touch on, I, I'm thinking of cloud computing, for example, as an area where the stay-at-home economy uh, benefited as well. And, and your ETF, CLOU, was one of the more popular uh, ETFs. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's that's correct. So, you know, e-commerce and video games were not the only themes that, that were accelerated during the stay-at-home economy. Um, you know, as you mentioned, cloud computing, uh, really facilitating that ability to work from home uh, via, you know, our, our, our cloud ETF. Um, another one, robotics and artificial intelligence. A lot of companies were trying to figure out how to automate more systems uh, so that more workers could stay at home or that they could limit in-person interactions. So we saw an acceleration of robotics as well uh, during the stay-at-home economy. So it's not just these two themes that were accelerated, but I think they're really kind of the most representative uh, of that uh, shift to digitalization um, as we were uh, really kind of uh, locked inside for, for a few months there. Thanks, and I'll let you move us to the next slide, but I'll use this as an opportunity to encourage uh, listeners to submit their own questions, and we'll get to as many as we can by the end of the presentation. Perfect, thanks, thanks, Todd. And um, so after the stay-at-home economy, we transitioned to the reopening economy. As I mentioned, uh, this was really a tenuous environment. We started to see that better treatments, um, the development and approval of vaccines, uh, new uh, social norms being put into place, like wearing masks and social distancing, allow people to start to resume that more normal economic activity, going into stores in limited capacities, going into the office from time to time, sending their kids back to school. But the reopening economy, which to be clear, we're still very much in, we have not reached the new normal economy yet, although we might be close, uh, has several key characteristics that are different from the stay at home. We still have COVID-19 flaring up, we're still seeing additional rounds of fiscal stimulus to support a weakened economy. We're seeing those new rules being put in place to try to limit um, uh, the spread of the pandemic. 
But we're also seeing that companies and people are still relatively risk adverse. Um, not everyone, but a lot of companies don't want to force uh, employees to go back to the office until they know it's going to be a safe environment. Many people don't want to be in crowded areas like concerts or supermarkets for fear of getting, uh, you know, for fear of making it this long and, and not wanting to get COVID at this point. Travel bans are still very much in place, so you can't just travel around the world or even within the United States without thinking about quarantines or, or vaccine passports. And then finally, the uncertainty in certain areas of this economy are creating uncertainty in other areas. If you don't know if you're gonna be able to bring your kid to school in person, that might influence your decision to go into the office that day and vice versa. If you don't know whether you can go into the office, it might change your plans for how you're thinking about your kid's schooling. So this tenuous reopening economy has created a lot of uncertainty but at the same time, the themes that were accelerated during this stage of the pandemic were really those that focused on safety and flexibility. Um, the technologies and the, and the consumer trends that allowed people to feel more comfortable amid this uncertainty. Now, if you go to the next slide, I'll highlight two of those themes um, that really were well positioned during the reopening economy. It might be frozen here. Next slide, please. All right, I'm not seeing the next slide pop up yet, but I'll voice, uh, I'll voice over. Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, the two themes that we really saw being accelerated during that reopening economy phase with that focus on flexibility and safety Again, cloud computing, as we've been talking about, as well as genomics. So cloud computing, yes, it was really critical in the stay-at-home economy as people had to work from home. But what was a little bit unexpected during the reopening economy was that it really started to solidify that cloud computing was going to be a part of our lives for the long term. The longer we've stayed in the reopening economy, which is now you know, coming up to almost a year, uh, we've realized a dependence on, on uh, communications platforms like Zoom or Slack, uh, a dependence on, uh, on cloud-based uh, software and data that we can access from anywhere, whether it's on our laptops at home or in the office. What we've seen is really these habits of working from home in this flexible environment are becoming more and more ingrained in us. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the survey with preferences for work from home. There's a huge preference now for many employees to work from home going forward, even after the pandemic. So our reliance on cloud computing, which started in the stay-at-home economy, has really been solidified in the reopening economy and is likely to carry forward um, well beyond. The other theme that we saw really uh, emerge in the reopening economy was genomics. Uh, genomics is the study of the human genome and other organisms. Uh, it really was involved since the beginning of the pandemic with uh, first sequencing uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, but then on top of that, building the tests um, that allows people to see whether they might be infected with COVID-19. And then, of course, beyond that, developing the treatments and the vaccines that are now uh, starting to really uh, curb the spread of COVID-19. So amid that reopening, amid that uncertainty, amid that uh, desire for safety, uh, we saw that a lot of these genomics companies were really at the forefront of fighting COVID-19 and allowing people to feel comfortable to resume NBA games or to reopen universities to students because of that ability to massively test and distribute vaccines. Okay, I'm going to jump in again here. Uh, I'm just curious from uh, the reopening economy, you know, you mentioned travel. Are, are hotels and, and airlines part of, of the reopening economy from a thematic perspective in your view? From a thematic perspective, not so much. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of people talk about airline stocks and hotel stocks as kind of this telltale of, of whether reopening is really happening or not, but from a thematic perspective, not so much, um, because there's there's not a lot of structural trends that are propelling the long-term growth of airlines and hotels. As a matter of fact, we've actually seen the opposite, um, that as consumer habits have evolved and, and, uh, and corporate habits have evolved um, during the pandemic, uh, that actually some of those um, industries are likely to be really hampered in their growth over the long-term. Uh, Boeing, uh, you know, largest manufacturer of airlines in the world um, expects airline airplane deliveries to be down 10% versus their expectations prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So they're anticipating less travel as people either continue to use digital experiences or in the corporate world, we continue to use Zoom rather than meeting people in person. 
Um, so, you know, while, while airline stocks and hotel stocks might do better as the vaccine rollout continues, from a thematic perspective, there really isn't that long-term structural growth that we see in something like cloud computing, which really benefits from that hybrid reopening environment, as well as long beyond that. Thanks. So that brings us now to the real the real uh, meat of this presentation, which, which are the themes that are well positioned for the new normal economy. We saw what worked during the stay at home economy. We saw what worked during the reopening economy. Now what we're trying to anticipate is what will be the themes for uh, this next period. Now I wanna make an important distinction here because the new normal economy is going to be a much longer term phase. Uh, it's effectively indefinitely until the next un, you know, black swan event happens. Whereas the stay at home economy was really just about three or four months long and the reopening economy will probably prove to be about a year long period. So when we're talking about the new normal economy, we're really talking about what are some of the lessons and behavioral changes and lingering economic impacts of the pandemic that are going to be influencing the governments and, and corporations and people for potentially decades going forward. And there's two that really stand out to us over this long term. The first is about rebuilding for growth. Even in 2021, as we're seeing accelerating economic activity in the United States and around the world, there's still anticipated to be a GDP out output gap of about 1.7%, meaning had there not been a pandemic uh, at all, we would expect GDP to be um, higher by 1.7%. That lingering impact is expected to be there for several years to come. Outside the United States, that lingering impact could linger uh, even longer uh, as certain emerging markets take longer to recover. But effectively, we're still dealing with that challenge of a weakened economy. Uh, we have high unemployment. We have this GDP output gap. We still have very low interest rates, which means it's very easy to borrow and to stimulate economic growth if you're willing to tap into borrowing which creates a unique window uh, to really focus on, um, on, on building something both for the short term and the long term, uh, which we think really uniquely aligns with US infrastructure development, building in the short term to facilitate longer term economic growth. The second aspect of this new normal economy that we think is going to be really a key theme for the next decade plus is preparing for the next crisis. Now we don't know what the next crisis will be, uh, but we have a very good indication of what a future crisis could be, which is uh, the impending uh, climate issues that we're seeing with rising temperatures around the world and growing billion dollar climate events. Are there lessons that we can learn from COVID-19 around planning for future crises that we can expect? Not necessarily know when they're gonna happen, but know that the likelihood of them happening over the long term is very high. Are there other lessons we can learn beyond just being prepared about international coordination uh, climate change, like the pandemic, doesn't respect uh, borders. Um, it's going to happen uh, and requires a global effort to contain, um, just like the pandemic has. So as we think about the new normal economy, uh, we're going to talk about these two themes more in depth and why we think they're so uh, well positioned uh, as we take these lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and inherit these economic realities. So digging into U.S. infrastructure development, um, Again, this is a theme that we saw, you know, that we that we really started to tackle prior to the to the pandemic. We launched an ETF on this PAVE back in 2017. As we noticed that whatever happens, we know that infrastructure has been grossly underinvested in, in the United States. Uh, right now, over the next 10 years, there's about a $2.59 trillion investment gap, ranging in everything from surface transportation, you know, roads and highways, water infrastructure, electricity and electric grids, airports. A very expansive definition of infrastructure has been grossly underfunded uh, and is going to require trillions of dollars to make up that gap. You already starting, you're seeing this, uh, you know, impact things like the economy and, and human safety. 40% of major roads are in mediocre condition or worse. Seven and a half percent of American bridges are structurally deficient, uh, a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. And the United States has a disproportionately high number of traffic fatalities each year at 36,000. This is already the impact of infrastructure today without doing anything um, and receives a, a C minus grade from the American Society of Civil Engineers. But if we go to the next slide, um, you can see, you know, why this is happening and that, you know, why infrastructure has been so poor in the United States for a long time. It's really first, you know, first and foremost is the funding gap. Um, percentage of infrastructure being spent relative to GDP has been on the decline for the last 10 years. Um, it peaked around uh, just above 2% around um, 
uh, around the financial crisis as as we had a kind of short term infrastructure bill that that helped put people back to work and spend on infrastructure. But since then, it's really plummeted. We haven't seen any major federal infrastructure bills pass, even though it was talked about not just at this election, but the previous 2016 election being talked about by both um, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump uh, on their on their platforms. So it's something that everyone's aware of. It's something that people have been talking about investing for a long time, but we really haven't seen that major investment in infrastructure. And even if you if you were to extend this chart going backwards, um, this 2007 to 2011 peak is actually kind of an anomaly. You really haven't seen that 2% level of spending on infrastructure to GDP since the 1950s uh, with uh, Eisenhower's um, uh, Federal Highway Act, which built about 40,000 miles of roads around the country. So this is uh, really a much longer term trend that has allowed our infrastructure to crumble. Uh, not only the lack of investment, but demographics. We're continuing to see population growth. We're seeing people move to cities, although maybe that's a little bit uh, uncertain at this point. And we're seeing uh, that climate risks are starting to uh, really impact infrastructure as uh, flooding and, uh, and hurricanes and wildfires are, are, are accelerating the depreciation of infrastructure faster than just if we were using it on a regular basis. Next slide. And on, on top of that, on top of the lack of investment in infrastructure, what we're also seeing is a changing definition of infrastructure. As we continue to transition more towards digitalization, we see that infrastructure is no longer just about roads and highways or even airports. It's really about digitalizing every aspect of our infrastructure. Part of that is making sure that widespread, uh, widespread broadband is available to everyone, including the latest uh, uh, next-gen networks like 5G, which should increase speeds and capacity. Uh, it's about using smart infrastructure that can be more efficient, like smart grids, so that we can have a decentralized electricity generation platform with solar panels on people's houses. Uh, it includes uh, collecting data uh, at the street level to reduce traffic uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, traffic congestion, uh, to be able to let people know when certain pieces of infrastructure, whether it's uh, public transport, is available or where it's not available. But all of this is really kind of bringing, it, it's not just about rebuilding the infrastructure we have today, it's about also modernizing it and bringing it into the 21st century uh, to provide that, that uh, longevity to infrastructure that we need for the next century. So, of course, uh, the most kind of relevant thing to all of this today is the American Jobs Plan, which uh, we just saw announced last week by President Biden. Um, this has the opportunity to accelerate that, uh, that investment in infrastructure. You know, we talked about the $2.6 trillion gap. Uh, Biden's plan is, in, is planning to invest $2.25 trillion, 1% uh, of GDP over the next eight years, which could uh, certainly help close that gap, if not totally, you know, but but not quite totally um, close it. Uh, and his plan also has a very wide, broad definition of infrastructure. Uh, it does include physical infrastructure like transportation, uh, but it includes buildings and schools and hospitals. It includes infrastructure resilience for climate change. It goes even further, though, to include energy, water, and digital infrastructure. So uh, starting to really develop our clean tech capabilities in the country, uh, enhancing our water utilities and water infrastructure, and building out uh, widespread broadband uh, for uh, particularly rural regions uh, that don't have that connectivity today. Beyond that, there's, I, I think, what we would consider not even really quite infrastructure investments, uh, but investments in the U.S. economy uh, to accelerate innovation and research in areas like artificial intelligence, to invest in U.S. manufacturing, to uh, reshore manufacturing jobs to the United States, as well as to develop uh, wor our workforce uh, for 21st century jobs and providing more long-term care to the aging population. So all of this put together uh, shows that um, not only is U.S. infrastructure a theme that we think is going to be uh, in focus over the next 10 years in, in kind of the wake of the pandemic, but we're also already starting to see this action at Washington. Um, to give this a little bit of context, though, I think the chart on the lower right-hand side of this slide uh, is really helpful because I think, you know, for many years, people have been talking about the importance of a federal infrastructure plan. The reality is federal spending on infrastructure is quite small as a percentage of total infrastructure spending. Most of it still happens at the private sector level and the state and local government level, which means this federal infrastructure plan 
uh, is going to create a huge delta in total federal uh, in, in total spending. Uh, we would expect that private sector spending and state and local government spending would be relatively the same, but you would see that that you know five percent of total infrastructure spend from the federal government uh, expand dramatically if this bill were to pass in its current form, funding a huge amount of new infrastructure going forward. Now, the question we often get on that is: Is this plan going to be passed? Is this something that could become a reality? Um, you know, we don't have all the cards on. You know, we, we don't have any kind of unique information on that. Uh, but because uh, it's been ruled by uh, the Senate parliamentarian that this could be passed through reconciliation, it does seem like there's a fairly high likelihood of this plan being passed in Congress by later this year. Uh, it will have to be drafted by the House. It will have to be um, voted on in the House and make it to the Senate and then uh, would be passed with a, with a simple majority uh, if it, it indeed can make it through reconciliation. But the odds are looking quite high that this plan um, could uh, could be enacted and could really really accelerate this investment in infrastructure uh, that is so direly needed. Now we'll go to the next slide. I know we're uh, we're going a little bit over time here, but I'll talk about uh, our other theme uh, for the long term here. Um, not seeing the slide change, but I can start to kind of preempt it. Um, the second theme that we see uh, in this new normal economy really thriving is going to be the clean tech and renewable energy theme. Um, the reason for this is because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think there's going to be a renewed um, emphasis on trying to tackle global problems. Um, had there been better planning for the COVID-19 pandemic, better coordination among countries, uh, both in identifying um, uh, pathogens and developing vaccines and coming up with coordinated approaches to limiting travel and, um, and the stay at home economy, we could have tackled this pandemic in a much better way. Unfortunately, we, uh, as a globe, as, a, as, a, as an international um, uh, community, uh, we're very reactive to the pandemic and that has caused it to linger much longer than it otherwise could have had we been better prepared. So. I believe that this is likely to translate into better preparation for um, for uh, the resulting um, climate or the the ensuing kind of climate change pandemic or uh, or uh, uh, issue that could be uh, coming up in the next uh, decade or so. So that would really benefit the clean tech and renewables value chain. Uh, those are four different areas: uh, renewable energy sources like solar and wind, uh, electricity generation. Uh, the uh, development of better technologies for energy efficiency and storage, like batteries that can store that intermittent power and a smarter grid that can be less wasteful, as well as the electrification of transportation and buildings, and of course, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Those are all the segments that kind of consist of clean tech together, and the segments that we think would benefit from, uh, from the rise of, of, uh, of clean tech uh, in the wake of the pandemic. So, um, I guess just a little bit of background on clean tech for, for everyone's context. Um, for a very long time in history, uh, there was about 265 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. That has now risen to about 415 parts per, uh, uh, parts, uh, per million in the atmosphere, showing that we are seeing more carbon concentration. Over that same time, we've seen mean temperatures really rise over one degree Celsius from the 1960s. And it's estimated that about half of the emissions, uh, humans are responsible for about half of those emissions that have caused global uh, temperatures to climb. Go to the next slide. Because we've seen those uh, one, that one degree um, increase Celsius since the 1950s, we've seen a vast increase in the number of billion dollar climate events. Uh, they've effectively uh, multiplied from about four or five or six a year to now well over 15 a year uh, in the United States alone. Um, that's from hurricanes doing substantial damage, that's from wildfires, uh, you name it, but it's become all too common that we see these massive, massive disruptive events that are causing huge economic costs and huge societal costs um, uh, that are likely to continue to accelerate unless we really do anything to continue to stop that carbon in the atmosphere that is continuing to increase uh, global temperatures. If we look at current policies today and we simply project those forward, uh, we would likely be looking at a four degree Celsius increase um, by 2100. Um, 
Of course, uh, we've seen the U.S. re-enter the Paris Agreement uh, just in the last few months. The Paris Agreement is focused on limiting that temperature increase to just two degrees Celsius, uh, which would hopefully help stem some of those issues. Um, but regardless, um, some of the rising temperatures uh, would likely continue to increase those natural na uh, natural disaster frequencies, causing uh, people at risk who live along coastlines and continuing to cause lethal heat uh, for the global population uh, that is in very hot areas. So what's the antidote to all of that? Uh, basically, it's to spend a lot of money on clean tech. <laughs> Uh, estimates are that it will cost um, roughly $110 trillion to mitigate the climate disaster. Uh, we have spent a small fraction of that on the COVID-19 pandemic. So to put this in context, uh, you know, total, uh, total government spending on the fiscal stimulus for this pandemic is $5 trillion, $6 trillion. So in the United States, um, so if you take that globally, uh, it's still probably less than a fifth of, of what uh, would be needed to invest in clean tech. Um, also, to put that in context, $110 trillion is about the market cap value of every stock listed in the world today. So a massive, massive investment is going to be required uh, that's going to require that kind of global coordination to be able to stem this pandemic or this, uh, this upcoming um, challenge before it, uh, before it really has its full impact. Now, um, we are starting to already see support for clean technologies. Um, you see that residential solar installation has surged over the last few years. Part of that is just the cost of solar falling very quickly and making it more affordable, but you're also seeing changing preferences. Uh, we see that 86% of U.S. adults are in favor of funding search for renewables. Uh, we see very strong support for requiring utilities to produce renewable energy, uh, for providing tax rebates for EVs and solar panels. So we are already seeing this shift underway of greater uh, emphasis from consumers or individuals in pushing for greater clean technology in our everyday lives. That, of course, has the downstream impact of, of pushing companies to support uh, greater emphasis on clean tech. So companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Apple committing to carbon neutrality well ahead of U.S. government guidelines uh, to be able to meet those customers with what they care about, um, which is increasingly uh, investing in, in uh, clean technologies. But we're also seeing a lot of this uh, support happening at the government level. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we're seeing that uh, in the United States, uh, Biden is coming out with a plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, fully decarbonizing the power sector by 2035, uh, but also spending uh, the next uh, 30 years looking at reducing building emissions through electrification, you know, moving away from oil and natural gas, and using electricity for heating, um, electrification of the transportation sector, moving from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles, and reducing manufacturing emissions, including carbon capture at the source. Of course, as I mentioned, this is not just a U.S.-based issue. This is a global issue, much like the COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing China committing to achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, Korea by 2050, Japan by 2050, and many of the European countries committing to carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 as well. So this is, um, uh, we're, we're, we're already seeing kind of the accelerated uh, investment and the accelerated efforts to, uh, uh, to stem climate change. Uh, I think a lot of countries are using the opportunity in wake of the pandemic uh, to create greater investments, to forge greater international partnerships, uh, to try to tackle this um, this issue before it really comes to a T. Uh, but it will still require many trillions and many more commitments across many governments to achieve this uh, by the 2050 goal. So with that, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up with key takeaways. Um, as we mentioned, uh, the pandemic initially accelerated the adoption of several themes during the state home economy and the reopening economy. We saw enhanced uh, adoption of digital experiences, whether that was shopping from home, whether that was entertaining yourself from home. We also saw that safety and flexibility became really top of mind during the reopening economy as people adopted technologies that allowed them to start to go outside and resume some normal activities. So as we approach this new normal economy in this post-pandemic world, uh, we believe that there's going to be many implications from the pandemic that carry forward. Uh, yes, we will be able to go back out in person, uh, but in many cases, consumers have changed, our habits have changed, and our priorities have changed in wake of the pandemic. 
what we believe are going to be the themes over the long term that benefit from this new normal economy are those that take advantage of this unique economic situation with low interest rates, with high unemployment, and an opportunity to spend more at the fiscal level, such as U.S. infrastructure development, as well as being able to tackle the next challenge that's going to come up uh, in a global context, uh, such as clean tech being able to tackle uh, climate change. So uh, that wraps it up uh, for there. I know we went a little bit over, uh, but if you want to see any more research on any of these topics, please feel free, feel free to visit globalxcts.com slash research, where we're constantly posting updates on areas like U.S. infrastructure and clean tech. So Jay, I'm gonna I'm gonna open this up uh, in a moment for additional questions that that came in and 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 put another call out there for the audience. But I want to just highlight uh, we're covering these ETFs. Uh, we've chosen uh, that this get talked about in part because we have a five star rating on Pave, uh, which is the infrastructure ETF, and we have a four star rating on CTEC CTEC, which is the the clean technology. ETF. I wondered if you could spend a, a minute. I showed on a prior slide about PAVE, how it's performing differently than some of its peers. In our view, that's tied to the construction of it, pun unintended, that it's more exposed to industrials and materials. Um, maybe you could just expand on what is and is not inside that ETF. Uh, that that pun was intended. I, I know I know you've been thinking about that one for a while, but um, yeah, the the infrastructure space I think is really fascinating um, because there's really two different sides to infrastructure uh, from the investing world. One side is investing in existing infrastructure um, that could be utilities companies, that could be energy infrastructure like pipelines. Uh, if you look overseas, that can include you know airports that have uh, gone public or toll roads that have gone public, although that's pretty rare in the United States. So if you're looking to invest in infrastructure assets, um, there's dozens of companies around the world that are providing that exposure. They tend to be pretty low growth, uh, but they tend to pay a pretty high uh, dividend to investors because they just kind of generate a very consistent cash flow. What we realized uh, as we started researching the infrastructure space back in 2016, however, was that many of those companies, the existing infrastructure companies, are not necessarily those that are going to benefit from greater spending in infrastructure. You know, a federal infrastructure bill or greater private spending in infrastructure is going to build new roads. It's going to build new airports. Uh, it's going to build new smart grid technologies and, and, and new uh, water pipelines. So for many existing infrastructure companies, that might just be a cost to them. Uh, but for uh, the building of this new um, infrastructure, it's really going to benefit very specific parts of the economy. Um, so within our PAVE ETF, we're getting exposure to construction and engineering companies that do very large scale infrastructure development. So if you want to go build a highway, you have to hire, you know, a company like Jacobs Engineering to help do that. Uh, it includes materials um, like copper and, and, and steel producers, because a lot of those raw materials are going to go into the building of this infrastructure. Uh, it includes heavy machinery companies that machinery will be used to actually do the building. And it includes some transportation companies like uh, uh, railways that will be moving this machinery, people, and materials around the country to help facilitate that uh, development. So it's a very different portfolio than what people would think of as kind of global infrastructure, because we're not investing in the existing assets, we're investing in the builders of new infrastructure going forward. Got it. Uh, thanks for that. I'll move us forward uh, to the next slide, which I believe is going to pull up. Uh, again, thanks for the, uh, the q and I think we're going to pull up one additional poll question. If we oh, actually, uh, we'll, we'll pull up the poll question in a second. I'll use this as an opportunity to remind you, we just launched at CFRA something new. We talked about clean technology and clean energy. We at CFRA have expanded our model portfolio lineup to include ESG portfolios. One of those is an ETF portfolio. The four other ones our stock specific portfolios, and you can find out more information on Market Scope Advisor uh, about these portfolios. Um, can we pull up the additional poll question that we have? Um, and this is as as I we've been talking about thematic ETFs. It's probably worth uh, just understanding if you're currently investing in them. So simple question: uh, Yes or no? Are you currently? Do you have any thematic ETFs, whether it's from Global X or some of the other firms that are out there offering them? within your portfolio. Jay, I'm gonna leave this up for a second and ask you an additional question um, that came in about the new normal and, and somebody from the audience asked about cannabis. 
investing. The new normal seems to be uh, having legalization at the state level um, in an effort in part to raise taxes to pay for some of the things that we're talking about. Is, is Does an ETF like POTX uh, from Global X fit into the new normal? It does. So there's there's several different aspects to the new normal economy. You know, if, if we go back to the overarching thesis, you know, again, it's kind of the pandemic might be over, but we still have an economic reality from the pandemic that we have to deal with. One of those economic realities is that we have a massive amount of debt at the state and local levels. Um, now, the one point nine trillion dollar fiscal stimulus that was passed in uh, in February uh, does close some of that gap at the state and local level and will provide direct payments to many states that became very heavily indebted during the pandemic, but that's not necessarily going to solve the issue going forward. Um, you know, states and, and local governments have created a taxation system that was really designed for a different era, um, you know, whether it's collecting property taxes, whether it was, uh, you know, where people might be moving out of state or, or to different areas, uh, you know, collecting tolls on um, public transportation that people might not be using as frequently. Uh, or collecting sales tax if people are going to be shopping more online and maybe skirting some of that sales tax. So there's still going to be an ongoing debt problem at the state and local level uh, for the foreseeable future. And what we've seen is that's caused a really deepening interest in new for in, in authorizing new forms of tax revenue. Uh, so one of the big beneficiaries of that is going to be the legalization of cannabis. Uh, just last week, we saw New York has, has legalized cannabis sales and will be making it uh, available at retail levels in, in 2022. And Governor Cuomo was pretty blunt about it, uh, no pun intended, but he said that it was because they wanted the tax revenue, that they needed the hundreds of billions that they would expect coming in from the legalization of cannabis. Because if you're not finding new, uh, you know, if you're not finding new tax revenues, then you have to create them by raising taxes. And most taxpayers, I think, would rather have uh, would rather have a new form of tax revenue than say see their income tax rise. Got it. Uh, thanks for that. I'll move us to the next slide, which is as much going to highlight to you. Let's go back here. We'll leave this here. Uh, just to tee up the next webinar that we at CFRA are having. Uh, we do this, as I mentioned focus on ETFs, on fundamental research, and on legal edge and forensic accounting. We've got one tied to Apple. You can see the details here. We'd love for you to learn more. Apple is, is on a regular basis uh, going through legal challenges, and our, and our great analytical team can help you out to understand that. If you want coverage or understanding of the themes we talked about from CFRA's perspective, both at the individual reports, the industry level, the stock level, uh, we'd encourage you to, to trial Market Scope Advisor if you're not currently using it. Uh, that's our portal uh, that gives you a chance to be able uh, to do that. Um, and I want to thank everybody for sticking with us a little bit longer than we'd intended and for submitting your questions. If we didn't get to them, our job is going to be to follow up with you directly uh, so that you can get an answer to the question either from myself or from Jay or from experts at our respective firms. Jay, thanks for staying with us and, and really educating the overall research uh, efforts of what you and Global X are doing. Thanks for having me, Todd, and thanks everyone for staying on and listening. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity and looking forward to uh, continuing to provide updates on the new normal as it continues to evolve from here. Great. We're going to put the disclosures uh, through the, the next couple of slides here. And if you can stick with us to just respond to a, a 